I want to welcome everyone to our DTX Insider Series. Today, we'll, we have a great panel discussion lined up to discuss pharma and DTX, what it takes for to drive success. Before we get started, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jen Butler, Chief Marketing Officer and Partner at Decimal Health. And I want to go over a couple housekeeping um, items and introduce to you our DTX Insider Series, um, along with Chris Roy from the DTX Conference Series. And then we'll turn it over to Kamal and the panel to get kick off this series and with a lively discussion. Um, you will notice that all of your lines are muted right now. But this will be a lively discussion, and I do anticipate that everyone will have questions and want to participate. So please look for that Q&A button and feel free to ask your questions. We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end so that everyone has an opportunity to have questions addressed. If they don't get addressed, we'll follow up as well for you. So let me just say that we are so excited to announce that our DTX Insider Series is kicking off and we're proud to launch it with the DTX Conference Series. Um, they are a great collaborator in this partnership. As you know, um, DTX Conference Series has five different global events from the East, West in the US, Asia, London, and Berlin. Um, the great network of industry forward-thinking leaders that we're now able to bring to a forum for panel discussions like we have set up today. So let me turn it over to Chris Goy, who will give you a little bit more of an overview, and then we'll jump into the panel discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Um, so yeah, as Jen mentioned, uh, the DTX Conference Series is really excited to partner up with the Decimal Health team. And to bring you guys these engaging conversations outside of the conferences that we run in the US, Europe and Asia throughout the year. Those conversations on site are really valuable, but it's really great. And we feel fortunate to be in a position to continue the sharing of knowledge and carrying on these important discussions uh, throughout the year uh, via platforms such as this webinar. Um, so before I hand over to Kamal, I just want to take one moment uh, just to remind everybody that DTX West is coming up on the 22nd and the 24th of February in San Mateo, California. We've got over 100 expert speakers and 500 industry attendees, um, and it's set to be the largest meeting yet. Um, to kick off this webinar as well and to celebrate this partnership, um, I'm really happy to provide the listeners to this uh, inaugural webinar a 10% discount code, uh, decimal 10, you'll see it there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and with that little bit of promo out of the way, uh, I'll turn it over to Kamal, who will facilitate today's discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Chris. Um, and appreciate the partnership uh, with the DTX conference series, Chris. Thank you for being our collaborator on this. So welcome, everybody. Thank you uh, for, for joining us. I know that across all the different time zones, we're, we're a little bit awkwardly placed today. Uh, and I also appreciate some of our panelists joining us from Europe, where it's fairly late today. So thank you. Thank you all for that. <laughs> Um, today, as Jen said, is the kickoff of our, uh, what we're calling the uh, DTX Insider Series. Um, the vision behind the series was that, you know, I'd like, I'd get a lot of questions from across the different ecosystem players within DTX, asking questions that I had heard them talk about uh, to me um, in many different forums, but not tell each other these different things. And so I thought it would be really fun to have a forum to be able to have some of these more casual conversations with the movers and shakers in the industry so that you as the audience can benefit from some of these really interesting insights um, that we can really pull out and you're, you're, you're not going to find these insights on, on blogs and forums and whatnot. So that's the hope of the Insider Series and I hope we're successful in that. I have an illustrious panel today here with us. We have two sides of the coin. We're starting our series, obviously, with pharma as one of the biggest stakeholders in the DTX uh, world today. And then, um, you know, we have two players from pharma. We have two players who are uh, DTX platform companies uh, that have really good and interesting relationships with pharma. And what we want to highlight today is the, the many different ways in which pharma is thinking about DTX and how DTX fits within their business model. And they're thinking about how they service their patients better. And then also the experience of, of some of these platform companies selling into pharma and creating these interesting collaborations in, in how to move care forward and how to Im, uh, improve the experience for our patients and providers. And so you'll hear, hear from both sides of the island, and I'll try to make sure that there's 
Uh, there's moments here where, you know, if we're not agreeing on something, we'll dig deeper into it and, and, and get some resolution. So without further ado, I will love to turn it over to my panel for an introduction. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask each panelist to sort of give a quick introduction of themselves, their role within the organization, and how that role fits in with the vision that their organization has for digital therapeutics. And I'll get it uh, kicked off uh, by uh, Jan from UCB. Thanks, Kamal. Good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Jan van den Neuker. I'm based in Brussels, Belgium, in Europe, um, and I'm part of UCB's global care transformation team in neurology. We are a biopharmaceutical company present in neurology and immunology, and I'm on the neurology side. Um, we look at all digital health solutions um, from sometimes our research colleagues over clinical all the way to commercial though we are linked and we have our home in the commercial uh, unit for neurology at UCB. Awesome, thank you, Jan. Uh, moving over, Amea. Hey, very nice to, very nice to be here. Um, so my name is Amea. I lead non-pharmacological solutions for Chiesi. For those of you that don't know about Chiesi, we are a, um, <clears throat> a mid-sized pharma company with a global presence uh, headquartered in Italy. Um, and primarily in respiratory, special care, and um, and rare diseases. And so, you know, we've had a, you know, we've, we've had some really interesting collaborations there. Um, I also just like to let you know, um, you know, I'm re required to inform you that, you know, the opinions, are, I'll, be, I'll be sharing my own opinions. So those are not necessarily those of Kiesi, but I think we can dive into um, some really interesting tidbits and trends we're seeing. Awesome. Uh, moving over, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris, you, you're on mute. Sorry. I'm Chris Lodge, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Twill. I've been with Twill for about six years. I came to Twill uh, after many years in digital therapeutics and digital health at PwC, where I did management consulting and worked with healthcare providers and pharma companies around the world. Uh, and then I also ran a digital therapeutic incubator at the University of Utah with the medical school, the business school, and the video game school. And when I joined Twill, it was at that time Happify, and it was actually to start the pharma business. So I started that business for them. It's now represents about half of all of our revenues and our activity as a company. Awesome. And finally, uh, Pierre. Yes. Hello, everyone. I am Pierre Laurent. I am the president of uh, Aptar Digital Health. Aptar Digital Health is a new division that was created by Aptar Pharma approximately a year ago. Aptar Pharma is a world leader in uh, drug delivery systems that started their digital health journey approximately five years ago. On uh, I joined Aptar Group following the acquisition of Voluntis, uh, the company that I co-founded and headed. Uh, and I have uh, 20 years of experience working in digital health, both in the US and Europe. Uh, happy to be here with you today, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you all. Thank you for that quick introduction. I appreciate that. So um, as I kick off the uh, the webinar today, uh, our, before, my first question is geared towards Jan and Ameo for, for the two of you. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys sort of what is your organization's specific um, sort of intention behind DTX? So what is it that you think DTX can do? And then what do you think, uh, how does that fit into whatever your core organizational uh, mission and structure might be? Um, Jan, maybe starting off with you. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um... We are not a front runner nor a leader when it comes to applying DTX. We're tipping our toes in the water since a couple of years with respect to pure digital therapeutics. Um, because if you take our main uh, disease states in which we're active, it is uncertain whether the DTX will solve for the disease itself or rather for comorbidities that are quite common with chronic conditions. Um, and so with that, the value case, whether you aim at solving for the comorbidity and how that works versus working on the prime disease state that you're solving and helping those patients for. Um, there is a nuance there which makes it more complex to solve for um, a DTX in, in my case, for example, epilepsy, where we explored multiple options already. I think that's yeah, I think just to add I think just to add to that, you know, so I think also just speaking Speaking to the industry at large, right? I think you, um, you know, you see kind of a couple of different views towards DTX, and I think it's also it's very dependent on what the, I guess, the mechanism of action, if I used kind of pharma pharma terminology, would be on the DTX, right? So I think Jan hit it right on the head. Is it is it targeted at um, kind of the the prime disease pathology that the pharma company has a focus in? 
Um, and then also to what extent does the DTX lend itself to, um, to generating the outcomes, right? So is it an outcome that um, kind of amplifies the impact of a medication? Is it an outcome that kind of stands on its own? And so in some cases, you know, you may see models where uh, the DTX is, you know, the pharma company enters a partnership with the DTX where it's not actually connected to a specific medication and it's somewhat separate from, from the brand. You know, as an example, you know, for Kiesi, the, the partnership that we, we have with, uh, with Kaya Health, which, you know, recently we, uh, we got reimbursed in Germany. Um, but on the flip side, there are also some DTX where their mechanism of action is they, you know, they're effectively force multipliers and, you know, have some data where the, you know, they're that much more effective uh, in combination with the medication. So I think it really depends on the underlying problem that you're, um, that the DTX is intended to solve and yeah, like the proposed purpose or, or how, how it, how it can generate those outcomes. So I, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. You kind of have to look at the disease state as well as the, um, as well as the DTX itself. Just to probe on that, Amea, is the approach that that pharma companies are taking then, is it more, I have a problem to solve, I'm going to go and figure out how DTX can help me solve the problem, or is it more, oh, that's an interesting DTX uh, play in my in my therapeutic area, let me see how it fits in or what problem it's solving and whether it fits into my portfolio, or is it both? I think, I think it comes down to what problem the patient is having, right, and to what extent the DTX can, can mitigate that. Um, and I think that is a, I think it's, 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 an, it's an important nuance. Um, you know, I think we've kind of seen pharma chase a lot of a lot of trends in terms of hey, here's a hammer, let me find let me find a nail, um, you know, AI blockchain, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, you know, I think in my mind, I think the pharma companies that seem to be doing this with with a purpose, it's really hey, look, we're trying to address this this medical unmet need, and the DTX is how we do it. Very similar to how they you know decide to to launch a specific uh, drug therapeutic program, not right. You 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 start with you start with the need on the patient or the disease side, and then kind of work your way backwards, as opposed to saying, "Hey, here's the technology work, we plug it in." Okay, great. I, I agree. Um, Sorry to add. I agree, and and the de-risking of the value that it brings, and I mean, our approach typically is we look for weak signals that there's already value with small groups yeah. of people that are using either that type of technology or something similar it might be even a paper alternative and then grow from there to see okay can digital scale that is there a way to augment that experience is there a way to scale that experience and there are some amazing companies out there that really took something that already existed in a really premature form and digitized it to an augmented experience yeah like, I mean, I think it, sorry go ahead come on I just wanted to probe on that. Jan, would you would you mind sharing an example or two of that? What you've seen in the market? No, I would prefer to refrain from name dropping of companies. If you're okay with that, Kamal. Um, yeah. But I think I think just just to follow up on on Jan's thread, right? I think in my mind, I think the most compelling um, you know DTX plays are ones where they identify a behavioral intervention that you know is generally well accepted to work. Um, and what the DTX does is effectively codify that into software because there, the reason this is important is when you start discussions with, um, with physicians, with patients to try to get this kind of thing adopted in clinical practice, um, if you focus, like what you want to do is do whatever you can to avoid this being shoehorned into, oh, it's an app that does X, Y, Z, right? Because at that point, you are, you're, you're basically inviting the comparison to a consumer app, not a medical intervention. And so, you know, the, you know, I, ideally being able to focus on what's under the hood, right? What is a behavioral intervention that is essentially codified, where the software is basically just the delivery mechanism of getting a behavioral intervention into the hands of patients or physicians or what have you. So in my mind, I think the most successful DTX companies are ones that have really been able to do the, you know, take things that we know work, but just make it more scalable. And in some cases, um, in a way that only, only a digital modality can. Got it. That's awesome. Thank, thank you both for that. Uh, turning it over to the other side of my panel, um, Chris and Pierre, would love to hear from you guys as you're starting to go and or as you're as you're going and creating these relationships and collaborations with pharma companies. What are some of the use cases and what are some of the motivations that you're seeing coming into you from pharma and and sort of what are some of the unadvantages that you think you're solving and why is pharma incentivized to work with you guys? Um, maybe Chris, starting with you. Sure. So we've seen the answer to that question change over time. 
Uh, five years ago or so, uh, pharma was very interested in this whole PDT focus. So maybe we can make more money by providing a digital product with our drug. And I would say it was predominantly driven by this revenue interest. Uh, and that's largely gone. I don't think, I mean, I can point to two or three examples where there's some pharma companies still focused on revenue opportunities, but most of them have really uh, begun to focus primarily on their core business opportunity, which is they're in the business of selling drugs, therefore digital, if it's going to help them you know, sell more drugs, then it makes sense for, for their business. And when you think about selling more drugs, you get into this issue of, of some people call it whole person health, we call it precision health. But it's this issue that the drugs that pharma companies sell are focused on a very narrow and oftentimes a singular mechanism of action. Uh, and they really aren't about behavior change, except to the extent they want them to take a pill or to inject themselves or do, do infusion. But that's only behavior they're talking about. They don't get patients to address issues such as sleep, diet, exercise, controlling and managing their thoughts. Uh, and when you look at healthcare spending globally, half of all healthcare spending is associated with bad behaviors that could change. And if we change those behaviors, we would eliminate half of disease, we would eliminate half of costs, and that's even in diseases that we're not curing. So if you look at the comorbidity of anxiety, depression, diet, exercise, and sleep associated with autoimmune disorders, inflammatory disorders, it's very high. And if you can control those things, then you can actually decrease the symptoms uh, associated with these other autoimmune disorders that we're not curing with drugs, we're treating with drugs, but you can get better outcomes if people have better thoughts, diet, exercise, and sleep. So you know, what we're focused on as a company is, is whole patient health. We're helping the patient deal with a lot of problems. You know, most of the patients, for example, that use our MS products actually have cardiometabolic conditions as well, right? They're obese or they're overweight and they might have diabetes, they might have prediabetes. And so the patient doesn't want just something for MS, they want something that deals with all their health issues. And the, the problem with the drug industry is that, it, again, it's focused on getting approval for a very narrow mechanism of action for a specific molecule. And that doesn't deal with the broader health issues a patient has that really require behavioral change. And so back to Jan's point, what we're doing is we're saying, look, we, what we're good at is behavior change. We're good at finding patients, activating patients, engaging patients, keeping them on our therapy and your therapy for period, long periods of time, so that they then have better clinical outcomes, they have better quality of life, uh, and they decrease medical costs. And that's our value proposition. Now, some of our value proposition, this gets into why our business is focused more broadly than some. Some of our value proposition resonates with employers. Some of it resonates with health plans. Some of it resonates with, with healthcare providers. Some of it resonates with pharma companies. But we're using the same mechanism of action and method of action in our products but they deliver different types of value that different stakeholders are willing to pay for across the healthcare spectrum. And generally speaking, to get patients to do any of this, it has to be free to the patient. And so you've got to get somebody else to pay for it. Uh, but then we find the patients, engage the patients, activate them, and get them to have better health. Got it. Pierre, are you are you seeing similar are you seeing similar um, opportunities or feedback from pharma? Uh Yes, uh, and I would add that, you know, uh, from our standpoint, I mean, our goal is to, uh, you know, improve patients experience and outcomes, you know, with digital solutions and we are typically, uh, you know, seeing pharma engaging with us to, you know, uh, address several specific challenges that they face with their existing therapies. So, for example, it can be a clinical challenge or it can be a business challenge uh, for their franchise. So, uh, I mean, now, for example, if you take specialty pharma, uh, in many cases, you have drugs that are, you know, maybe have a complex administration profile. They have to uh, you know, be injected or patients need help, you know, uh, getting started on therapy. Uh, so there is a, a, you know, a, a, a case to provide more, let's say, onboarding support uh, at this time of, uh, of initiation. We also see some, uh, you know, dosing challenges for certain therapies. We uh, also see a particular toxicity profile, which makes it complicated for you know patients to uh, you know to have a, a good quality of life you know when they are on, on therapy so uh, you know those issues translate into uh, 
you know, suboptimal use of the drugs, you know, uh, early discontinuation, uh, even, uh, you know, switch to other therapies and, and so on. So we, uh, we try to really, uh, you know, identify, you know, these particular needs and see how our, you know, digital interventions can, uh, can help move the needle. If you look at, uh, at business challenges, you know, it, uh, interestingly, we, we have seen uh, across our portfolio of collaborations, you know, multiple, uh, let's say, uh, contexts uh, on times during the product life cycle when pharma has, you know, started to engage with us. So it's not, you know, uh, it's not, a, you know, one unique pattern, you know, you have now even drugs before they get commercialized, they start to think about, you know, a digital companion approach, you know, uh, it can start as uh, early as phase two uh, when they they see a specific signal uh, around the drug, you know, for example, a drug that is, uh, you know, complex to use or with a particular toxicity profile, maybe it's compelling to think about a, a digital uh, tool that will help patients uh, along their treatment journey. But it can be also another, uh, you know, uh, another, uh, you know, strategy or where when we see, uh, you know, increased competition in the field, there is a, a need for further differentiation. Or even now you start to see also some thinking within pharma when drugs, you know, uh, start to reach, you know, the end of, uh, of their, you know, patent protection. Uh, there might be a case to uh, provide a different, uh, let's say, uh, formulation of the drug uh, with, you know, uh, digital coupled with it. So there are various use cases where you see see, uh, you know, uh, a compelling use case uh, to introduce these kind of solutions. I would love to take some of those examples and, and run it by our, our pharma panelists. But starting actually um, with, with Chris's comment on, you know, instead of having a separate revenue line item, really thinking about the use of DTX as a way to increase, um, you know, drug use or, or, you know, that positioning. Uh, I mean, I, I, I saw the press release that you guys had with Kaya and the fact that you got, you know, DICA uh, approval and reimbursement. So it sounds like because reimbursement is important to you, you're thinking about that as a um, as an uh, independent play. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the philosophy of, you know, whether the role of DTX is, is limited to being paired up with drugs or do you see other use cases as well? No, I mean, I think, I think both. I think you have to look, um, I think just coming back to the the underlying use case and the mechanism of action, right? So as an example, um, is the behavioral intervention in question, right? A, is there a way to kind of generate, generate some kind of business return for it, right? So is reimbursement something that is viable? And there you kind of also have to consider not just the use case, but also the geography, the underlying evidence required and, and all, that, <clears throat> all that fun stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, you, the, and then the other part is when you think of the patient journey to actually get to use this intervention, what are the various web of stakeholders that are involved there? And to what extent does the pharma company have access to those stakeholders or what extent do they not, right? So I think you kind of have to consider the, you know, the underlying unmet medical need. I think, you know, just coming back to the point that I made about the behavioral intervention, the non-DTX behavioral intervention that is codified into software, what does the journey look like for that? Um, are there efficiencies that you can introduce there? Um, so, you know, I think, you know, there's certainly a few, um, I definitely, I would say not a large number, but I think there are a few other examples as well of pharma companies kind of looking at DTX, um, you know, as a standalone that's kind of not linked to a specific drug. And I mean, for me, I think philosophically, the pharma, you know, pharma companies' true product is, is outcomes, right? And so, you know, thinking about it from a philosophical standpoint, um, you know, you could even look at where drugs and behavioral interventions are, you know, essentially different features of the same kind of overall product, if, if, if you want to, if you want to call it that. So I think, again, you want you, because the other part to think about also is when you're linking a DTX to a medication, thinking about the underlying unit economics, can you actually build a business case around that? Um, and then from a medical, from a credibility standpoint, right? So, you know, would, would a physician, you know, Convincing physicians, for example, that a DTX isn't a um, a toy in a kid's meal, right? To use uh, to use the terminology that I think I heard at DTX East a few years ago. So there's a lot of these things that you kind of have to consider. And so I don't I don't think there's a one size fits all model. I think it's it's very dependent on on the therapeutic use case, the patient population, and and all of these. And that's kind of where I think it's important and for both the pharma company and um, the DTX partner to be intellectually honest with each other, but more importantly themselves in terms of, you know, for a given DTX initiative, what, what does it lend itself well to? Let me address something here that 
kind of was alluded to, but really hasn't been said. And that is that <clears throat> farm is at a turning point in their history as an industry. Um, do they want to have a relationship with a patient or just with a physician? And when you look at, uh, and we recently did a, a study with one of our pharma partners, you know, we just do the nature being digital, right? We gather lots of information on these patients. Uh, and we know a lot about them. We know the level of severity of their disease. We know what drugs they're on. We know how long they've had the disease. We know what type of clinician they're visiting. We know how they're using our products. We know how we're improving their health and whatnot. And when we compare this type of information with one of our large pharma partners, we found that best case, they had that type of information on 10 to 15% of their patients. Best case. And this is one of the companies that's most advanced in development and having a patient relationship. Okay, but we have it with 100% of our patients. And we actually compared data and we saw the difference between the two, okay? So, you know, what does pharma aspire to do? If they really wanna have a patient relationship, they have no choice but to go digital because they're not gonna develop it in an analog world. You know, paper and pencil isn't gonna do it. So, so that's a question, and not every pharma company has answered that question. At a very high level, their CEOs will say, we have a patient relationship, blah, blah. they don't, okay? And part of it also has to do with different uh, you know, kind of regulatory frameworks that we're dealing with in different parts of the world, kind of how much can they really do outreach and have that versus have the relationship with the physician. But this is really where we're at, that digital is enabling not only a new type of therapy, not only a way to be a companion with the drug, but also enabling a relationship with the patient that can last over a long period of time, can be very broad-based, even with lots of comorbidities, lots of symptoms that go beyond that singular drug, and also gathering insights with regards to what makes a patient healthier. Does pharma want to do that? Do they want to invest the time, the money, the effort to do that? It's really interesting. Thanks, Chris. Um, Jan, just sort of back to you on, you know, everything you're hearing from, from uh, the three others on the different models for DTX and, and what makes sense or what doesn't make sense for, for, for your overall business model. Any comments on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so when, I mean, going back to what Amaya said, it's looking about the outcome you try to achieve. Um, maybe another elephant in the room is, do you want to solve for well-being or do you want to have a therapeutic effect when you're looking beyond the pill? Um, and, and it's each time in that exercise where you go, where is the boundary between what we can do with a well-being experience for the patients that might take them somewhere in the holistic care journey versus looking at more mature companies and what they have developed and created with respect to a real digital therapeutic that really solves for multiple dimensions of the patient. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is um, as much as we like to slice and dice people in cohorts and sub-cohorts and sub-sub-cohorts, et cetera, um, I prefer to think that every human is unique. And yes, you can find clusters of people together for which a certain experience works. Um, but at some point that becomes overly complex and with all... Um, the traditional thinking, I would call it that way, in pharmaceutical companies, um, it is often a faster pathway to trust in a med tech company, which often the DTX companies really are, which have uh, the learnings and the burden to go through multiple disease state, multiple different customers, and with that accelerate and would do any of the work they're doing today way faster than the pharmaceutical industry could do. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's that's really interesting. What what does so as you're thinking about the different use cases on the pharma side, and you know, you, I'm I'm sure you, you're 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 evaluating a lot of different potential companies to engage with. What makes a DTX company, whatever it might be, a DTX product company or a platform company or whatever, what makes them a good partner? How do you how do you select who you work with? What what is the thought process behind that? Uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead, if you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I can. I think the general kind of process that I go through, right, is um, at the start, 
is the underlying problem, and when I say problem, the, un the unmet medical need, is there an obvious well-recognized medical need? Um, to what extent is this medical need unmet, right? So is a, is, a, is, is a status quo kind of acceptable? Is it completely broken? Um, to basically how bad is the situation that this kind of has to step in and fix, right? Then you kind of look at, okay, to what extent does a given solution address that, at least from a first principles perspective, right? And then do they have any kind of any kind of supporting information? Then the next level you look at is, and this is actually one that I think, especially in today's environment, is particularly important, which is from an operational perspective, does this look like a company that is, is well run? Does this look like a company that can actually survive for the next five, seven years? You know, and these are there's a lot of signals you can pick up on that, right? In terms of like from a longevity perspective, is it just is it a well-run business that you think will still be around five to seven years from now? And then the last point, and this again is uh, is from a cultural perspective, is there a cultural fit between the team internally that is going to execute on this initiative if a partnership goes forward, and and the DTX company, right? And I and I would argue that a vast majority of DTX pharma partnerships that don't work out. It's because of the pharma partner, not the DTX partner, right? I think it's the DTX partner not being put in the right place to succeed. Um, it's typically not having the right level engagement with the folks at the pharma company that are expected to do the work, especially the folks at the country level, right? So you often have an initiative championed by some someone at global and then kind of shoved down the throats of the various country teams without really appreciating the various on the ground realities. Um, and then the DTX company is just kind of in some cases, suffocated, right? I think as an industry, we sometimes complicate things when we don't have to. And so I think, you know, the, and I, you know, I don't know if this is a segue, but, you know, to, in my mind, I think you know, we, we talk a lot about for a pharma partner, what makes the ideal DTX partner. I mean, I would argue with the DTX company, I think you need to really think through, does this pharma company deserve your partnership, right? Like, are they a good custodian of your solution? And do you, do you see them as somebody that you can create upside with? And if the answer is not a resounding yes, I would say move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can give you chapter and verse on every one of those examples that were just given and more, uh, where you know we, we did a deal with a European pharma company, signed the deal in November, January comes to start it, and we have to resell it to everybody in every country level of that partner because the country level hadn't bought off on it. It was done at the global level. And so we spent four months reselling it within each individual country, Spain, France, the UK, to get all of them on board in order to move it forward. We've got other ones where the pharma team is a revolving door. Every 18 months, everyone gets a new job. So we have to develop new relationships every 18 months with somebody new. Uh, and that new person wasn't part of the old decision process. So they're not really bought into it. So we've got to convince them that it's still worth, even though there's a signed contract, right? That that they should abide by the contract. And I've got other ones where, you know, people get fired. Uh, and so, I mean, the list goes on and on. I could spend hours just talking about each one of those situations with different pharma clients, but that is really, really hard. We're the stable one, right? To think all well, the, Startup companies, you don't have funding, you're not going to be around. No, I'm always around. It's you that are around. <laughs> that, that's great. Um, I'll come back to you on that and, and ask you about how you select the best pharma companies. But I also wanted to get Jan's opinion on, on the same question around, Jan, how do you think about going around selecting who you work with? Yeah, I mean, we have a similar approach to AMEA. We use different words to it. So we use desirability, feasibility, viability, and then strategic fit to it. And again, um, on strategic fit, there's a large portion on who is the team on their end and how can the two of us make three if we do one plus one? Um, because I fully agree, we try to be a real partner in the few deals and the few partnerships we do with companies rather than shooting large uh, as a portfolio and then hoping that uh, out of 10, two will be great. Yeah, I think the, the official word for that is spray and pray. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I, I think one other, just to add on to Chris's point, right? I think a major challenge many times is um, pharma companies, you know, 
try to avoid putting much skin in the game, right? And so as soon as there's somebody at the top changes, um, they decide, well, we're just going to go in a different direction, right? And so, and I think a big part of my thought process is, you know, when I when I do a deal, um, you know, if I, basically to make sure that there's enough skin in the, the company is willing to put enough skin in the game that the partner has the confidence that if there's some change, there is a significant cost to just changing willy-nilly, right? And now again, there may be some sound strategic rationale. Obviously, this is a very fast evolving industry. Things can change. Um, but that if a pharma company makes makes the decision to go in, to go in a different direction, that there is some downside to just doing it because someone says so, right? And so I think, and that's, you know, I think a lot of the really successful DTX companies I've seen in this case are ones that are kind of able to keep their pharma partners honest and make sure that they're actually willing to put some skin in the game because doing that is also in the pharma company's best interest, right? I mean, these are not partnerships that one would expect would yield fruit within six months to a year. I mean, these are multi-year in some cases, five, 10 years, you're, you're literally building a new market, right? And so um, making sure that your partner, you're, you're in some cases protecting the partner from themselves. And you, you know, I think there's a lot of really interesting contractual structures you can use to do that. But you know, I think that is really key, right? Is really just making sure that um, making sure that there's real commitment to see this through. And it's not just some, you know, I call it innovation theater. Great. Um, I want to flip that question now over um, to sort of um, Chris and Pierre and, and maybe just talking a little bit about, you know, obviously, what has your experience been on selling to pharma and really thinking about pharmas are large organizations. I think, as Amir was saying, that there's, there's you know, uh, country level teams, there's, there's global teams, there's all of these different stakeholders. What, the, what I've always heard is there's, there's more people saying no than people saying yes. Uh, and so what's that, how do you demystify that complexity of selling to pharma? And then the, the paired up question to that is, how do you select the pharma companies you want to work with? And, and maybe Pierre, we'll start with you. Yes, um, happy to share some thoughts on that. And I, I've seen a maturation also of uh, the discussions with pharma over the past you know, years, you know, uh, because we have, uh, I think, more and more, let's say, sophisticated you know, questions uh, on the topics that we cover uh, when we engage with a new pharma partner these days. So uh, I can share you know, uh, several aspects you know, that uh, our pharma partners you know, look into when uh, you know, they engage with us. I mean, uh, typically now they are looking for some experience also. Uh, I mean, we have been around for more than 10 years developing software as a medical device, you know, uh, in different uh, indications, different geographies. So the strength of the track record, you know, plays a big role in, uh, in the discussion. Uh, you know, pharma companies that are considering these new solutions also, uh, you know, uh, want to take advantage of, uh, you know, established frameworks for collaboration. They also seek advice from us, uh, you know, on how to, uh, you know, proceed on, uh, you know, what are the lessons learned from, you know, past experiences on what are the best practices we can, you know, bring to the table to implement a successful partnership. Uh, I think they also screen, uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, our, uh, our platform because we don't, you know, develop solutions from scratch. We, you know, uh, build on an existing, uh, you know, technology platform. We also have, uh, you know, when you develop software as a medical device solutions, you need uh, also, uh, you know, to have, uh, you know, a strong quality management system. They look for, you know, the type of regulatory clearances that were achieved, you know, like uh, so far with more like 15 clearances, you know, uh, secured in, in North America and Europe. Um, I think, you know, medical and scientific foundation is also, you know, important uh, in this conversation. So I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also important to look really at, uh, you know, interventions that make a you know, meaningful impact for, for patients. And those are, you know, need to be, you know, deeply rooted into science. And, uh, you know, obviously when you talk about DTX, you talk about clinical validation. So we want to make sure that uh, what we offer is, uh, is of significant value on uh, the fact that, you know, we have a medical affairs team is important also to uh, relate nicely with the medical counterparts within pharma uh, so they can speak the same language and work effectively together. Well, now it's, uh, you know, now that we have joined a larger industrial group, you know, to, uh, to Amaya's point, I think uh, what is interesting is that, you know, pharma is, uh, is also in interested in engaging with partners with, you know, industrial strength and global capabilities. I, I see that for the larger, you know, uh, programs, uh, when you need to deploy your solution in the US, in Europe, or in Japan, or uh, and potentially even additional countries, uh, it's good to have a global reach to be able to be an effective, uh, an effective partner of pharma. 
pharma. So I see you know, various criteria that you know, pharma is looking for these days to, uh, to engage uh, into a new partnership. That's awesome. Thank you, Pierre. Um, Chris, same thing. How do you, how do you sell into them? And, and then uh, how do you select the ones you want to work with? So on the selling into them, uh, let me add some other complexity that I think has been messed that everyone knows that's on this call. So uh, pharma is not just, uh, a particular company is not just one company, right? So most of these pharma companies have uh, probably 10 to 15 different billion dollar businesses within one company. Right? They've got a $2 billion MS business. They've got a $2 billion psoriasis business. They've got a billion dollar you know, um, uh, rare disease business or something like that. So, so you're really not selling into a company. You're selling into one of the 10 businesses within that company. Right? And then within that business, you've got the complexity of are you dealing with the R&D part? You're dealing with the commercial part? You're dealing... You know, with the digital part, and generally what happens to the digital people, all they are are concierge, right? They're out there looking for potential partners. They make introductions to the digital company, to the different parts of the organization, but they really don't have budgets. They really don't have decision rights. They're really facilitators uh, in that. And so, so even though a digital team might bring you in, you still have to then resell at the brand level, then you have to resell at the regional level uh, as well. So there's a, a very complicated sales process that generally takes about a year, at least that's our experience. If other people do it faster, good for them, but it doesn't take us, takes us at least a year. And the other thing is that the way the year long sales process works is that pharma companies only budget on an annual basis and only have enough money for one year. And so what they tend to do is say, okay, you know, we budgeted this amount to do something digital this next year. And so we're going to talk to companies and see what we can find. And they'll spend about a year trying to figure out how they're going to partner and who they're going to partner with. And then around September of that year, they're going to develop their budget for the next year. And they're going to say, okay, with this digital partner now to do this project, we've been scoping for almost a year now. We need this amount of budget this next year to start in January. And sometimes they'll say, well, we have a little bit of money left over from this year that we've got to spend or we lose. And so could we maybe start the project a few months earlier and we'll use this year's budget that's left over to accelerate the project. And then we'll use next year's budget you know, next year for it, right? So, so you've got all this complexity of the organization. You've got complexity around budgeting. And generally speaking, the pharma clients that we deal with anyway, they don't like multi-year projects because that means multi-year budgets. They don't know how much money they're gonna have in two years from now, right? They're, they may make a portfolio decision that says, we're not gonna spend another dime on this industry. We're gonna let this drug with three years from patent just run to the end. And so we're, we're doing nothing there, All right? So, so that's a, a complexity of it. Yeah, I think it depends on the type of the program. I mean, that we're talking about because you know you have a, for certain types of programs you need to have a multi-year view of things. On you have oh, to you know, project yourself on the long term. On you know we've had some programs that span over ten years. I mean, it's yeah. not atypical. I mean, on then you need obviously as to your point, Chris, yeah. you need to deal with you know people changes and so on. But you know it's a good sign if you know partnerships can survive. You know, uh, people changing roles in, the, in a specific organization. And that's why it's important also to commit to the right level of resources on to secure a high level commitment uh, as Amiya pointed out earlier. I think it's we, very we important. We've contracts with pharma companies that are supposed to be 10 year contracts. The contract says 10 years. The CEO gets fired. He brings in a whole new set of people. He fires, the new CEO fires everybody at the senior level. And so now you're starting new and then they're saying, you know, it's a 10 year contract, but we don't have 10 years of interest anymore. It's, or hopefully it's not automated that the change of CEO translates to a shift in the I'm in saying that's priorities. Happened, right? <laughs> I'm saying this is real life. This is what's happened. So it happens so we sometimes find regularly. <laughs> so what we find is that, well, in most of these CEOs in pharma only last five years, right? So they don't last 10 years either. So that the challenge is, and again, we're an N of one. So you know, Pierre's experience is better than our experience, but uh you know, we just find that it's a very difficult relationship with lots of changes, lots of complexity, very long sales cycle. And uh, you know, while we enter into multi-year contracts, the bottom line is 
you know, especially from our perspective, because we're not doing, you know, some like some other companies, we're not doing five year, 10 year licensing development deals. We do deals with pharma clients that we can be in market within three to six months with them, generating revenue for them within three to six months. Okay, that's the sort of business that, that, that we have. All right. And, and if we don't deliver that, they don't sign up for another year. So you're always being measured kind of to get an extension for the next year. And because they can cancel a contract, a multi-year contract at any time. And what are you going to do? Sue them? You're not going to sue them. You're just going to say, okay, you're going to walk away. So, you know, then the other part of this is how do we choose a pharma partner? Okay. Uh, so what we did is we said, we did an analysis and we said, what are we good at? We're good at anxiety and depression. We've got products that are wellness products, products that are non-prescription digital therapeutics and products that are prescription digital therapeutics in the mental health space. And we're really good at that. So which pharma companies have patients that have that problem that are not mental health drug companies? Because almost all those drugs are generic. So there's really not a lot of opportunity with the major drug brands in mental health. There's a few, but not many. So we looked at the comorbidities. And what we found is that there's about 50 different diseases that have very high comorbidities with anxiety and depression that we can make a meaningful impact on not only the patient's anxiety and depression, but their quality of life, their well being, but also the underlying disease that the pharma company is treating with their drug. So we came up with that list of 50. We looked at every pharma company in that area category and we identified which ones we wanted to partner with. So we were very targeted from the very beginning knowing exactly who we were going after and why. And we had a value proposition that was based upon, we can help you find new patients for your drugs. We can help you keep patients on your drug therapy. We can improve the patient's quality of life and well-being. We can provide therapeutic uh, benefits in anxiety and depression, as well as in some of the physical symptom, fatigue, pain, that you're dealing with your drug. Okay. And that's what we did. We went out very focused and, and specific in those areas. And so you see, we have, you know, a, a sequence around multiple sclerosis, a sequence around psoriasis, the sequence around menopause. We've got one around pregnancy and one around mental health. So that that's really interesting. I think the way you're you're framing sort of the the very targeted outreach. I think that's a very sh smart way to do it. On the on the receiving end of it, on the pharma side, um, sort of Jan and I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to. to um, find, and this is one of the attendee questions, so I'm going to double dip, um, sort of how do you decide which TA or which molecule would benefit from a DTX or a SAMD add-on? So is there a prioritization process internally for you on how you figure out which one to go after? And then and then maybe even sort of what what value proposition to go after within that that either that TA or that brand? So I can, I can speak to it a little bit. So I mean, you know, I think one of the calculuses you have to make is um, you know, from a patient journey perspective, are what are the kind of unmet needs and are there kind of behavioral interventions, right? And then you can kind of work backwards and say, all right, does this, does a given digital intervention for the, or digitization of this behavioral intervention, does it lend itself better to kind of a um, molecule, um, like a, 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 like a drug plus partnership or something that, that is separate, right? And I think this is where I think we can also get pretty interesting on, on deal structures, right? So for example, in some cases, um, the, you know, the deal structure may lend itself better to kind of an asset licensing deal where you're primarily dealing with the BDNL group, right? The business development licensing group. Um, and that's kind of where you see a lot of these kind of multi-year contracts where typically there's a sizable upfront. Um, there's also some pretty stiff termination penalties if the pharma company decides to, decides to up and leave. Um, but on the flip side, you know, if you're selling into the brand team, obviously those structures don't, don't make as much sense. So I think there's, there's also a calculus that we, um, that we go through. So it's, it's less so, oh, this is a molecule and I want to find a DTX for this molecule. It's more so about the underlying disease state, understanding kind of the behavioral subtypes of patients that, that, that a given drug touches, if you are going for that, that specific model, and then understanding to what extent does a given DTX move the needle for each of those subgroups of patients. Okay. And then ultimately doing ultimately just going through that calculus. And in some cases, um, just the reality of a given drug slash patient population is it just do doesn't lend itself well to a DTX approach. And again, that's kind of where I, you know, I like I mentioned earlier, you 
both the DTX company and the pharma company have to kind of be intellectually honest with each other and internally and saying, you know, sometimes the best deals are the ones you never do. And then the 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 rep, the ROI on that or the value proposition on that, it sounds like in certain cases, it might be sort of pairing it up with the molecule and then sort of having some of those business outcomes related to the molecule. And in some cases, you said that they're, it's independent of, of the drug. In that case, are you holding DTX to the same bar from a revenue and margin standpoint as you would hold any other business unit like drugs within your within your portfolio? Well, oh, I mean, um, you know, I think just speaking in more general terms, I mean, my hope and goal is that the word digital disappears from digital therapeutics over the next over the next four or five years, right? And that these are these are seen at the same at the same bar, right? Where they're interventions that lead lead to an outcome. Um, and again, when you look at it, you don't just look at it from a rev, size of revenue opportunity, right? You look at it, you whether you do kind of a net present value analysis, base, but basically the same level, the same metrics that you use for kind of traditional asset deals, right? And some of those deals will be massive deals. Some of those will be small deals, but ultimately, I think it is um, ultimately it is holding them to the to the same to the same metrics and and bars, right? And that's kind of how they're going to enter prime time. Okay, uh, so yeah. I think on some some of the metrics, though, just to be transparent here, right? Um, you know, we're dealing with pharma clients that have drugs that cost twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. We have no expectations we will ever have a digital therapeutic that has pricing like that, right? So our expectation is the pricing for a digital therapeutic will be fairly similar in the future to what you see today. In the DIGA in Germany, is somewhere between $200 and $1,000. Now, there is a crazy one that just got listed for $2,200 the other day, but, but I'm not expecting that to be the norm, okay? And that in the United States, we see pricing that's in the... Uh, you know, two fifty to fifteen hundred dollar range, and so, so that's so when we think about it from our own P and L perspective, right? That creates the the ceiling to how much we can charge. We believe for a digital therapeutic, and then we have to have a sales and marketing capability, a product development capability, a patient support capability, and everything else that can survive with a price point that is $500 to $1,000, okay? And that's not easy because we don't have the margin pharma has uh, to, to do this. Um, Jan, your perspective on, on, the, on the business model and sort of how you think about, you know, where DTX would fit well within the portfolio? Yeah, a couple, I mean, a lot has been said already, but I think if you want to assess this, you need to look at value holistically. And value holistically means what insights, what data, what um, drop-offs am I going to identify that I can get from the digital therapeutic experience and the platform around it that is offered to the patient that I would need to do with the market research and I avoid cost elsewhere. How am I driving longer patient adoption because, hey, I'm tackling an unmet need in their anxiety and with that they do remember that they need to take their therapy to continue to get the clinical benefits and not end up potentially with a seizure in the case of epilepsy. So if you limit the benefit to direct revenue, the model becomes more complex, I would say. If you look holistically and you look at all the other benefit drivers, whether that's data or insights in the patient journey, whether that is um, adherence support for patients, whether that is a next level of a patient support program, which the industry in its evolution has already established patient support programs. In personalization, DTX could be one of the levers to take it to a next level. Um, I think if you look at holistically, the value case makes sense, but you need to be mindful how you calculate it and where you put your bets and, and your limited resources. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Jan. That makes sense. Uh, I'm going to move to audience questions. I have two really quickly. The first one uh, from Leonardo on uh, any examples of DTX deployments and advanced cancer treatment. Pierre, I'll throw this over to you, given given your portfolio in oncology. 
happy to answer. So, I mean, digital therapeutics can have a, I mean, a, a significant you know, impact uh, to improve the lives of cancer patients. I mean, uh, think about uh, improving, for example, uh, symptoms management. I mean, now a, a number of therapies come, unfortunately, with uh, side effects that you know, negatively impact you know, patients' quality of life. So digital therapeutics can provide you know, interventions to guide you know, patients when they experience these symptoms to uh, you know, provide you know, real-time recommendations to tell them what they should be doing when the symptoms occur. So that will you know, hopefully let, help them you know, change their behaviors or you know, make better use of the drug, you know, uh, use the drug at the right dosage, introduce an additional drug to, manage, to go through this you know, uh, uh, symptoms management phase, uh, keep patients at the lower rates in terms of severity, avoid escalation to higher grades, and so on. So and ultimately uh, achieve uh, you know, uh, better you know, success in the therapy. And some studies now go as far as you know, showing that we can maybe improve survival, even when we introduce you know, digital tools plus you know, human interventions along the way also to, uh, to, uh, to help uh, with therapy optimization. So uh, there are, now there is an increasing you know, body of clinical evidence that show that you know, digital therapeutics can play a significant role in, uh, in cancer care and uh, we are pretty excited about you know the number of early use cases we see across you know different indications it's just the beginning but there is already a, you know a number of trials that have shown you know, the significant efficacy of these tools to uh, to make you know uh, the patients uh, uh, you know uh, uh, to, to, to bring them to a better quality of life and to help them stay adherent to their therapy on, uh, on achieve success and I, I, I don't the, I don't remember the exact name, but I, I recall at least one which is reimbursed in France for specifically in a cancer indication. Um, but yeah, yes. I mean, I think, I, I think pretty much any disease area where behavior can impact outcomes, which is basically anyone, I think you could make a strong case for DTX, including, yes. including advanced cancer treatment. Yeah. Uh, Amir, the next one is for you. What's the com synergy between the commercial organization at Kiesi and at Kaya, and how do you collaborate on the commercial side, if if at all? Yeah, so I mean, so we do. Um, that's not something I can unfortunately speak about in a, in a public forum, but I can kind of speak in in more general terms, right? Where you know, thinking about what does a pharma company bring to the table and what do they not, right? So, do pharma are pharma companies able to build software? I'm going to go out and say no. Right, and I think um, you know, pharma like that is one thing some pharma companies have tried, and I think it's a pretty. I, I, I think both Pierre and Chris will agree with me that um, building software is not in the top ten list of pharma com things pharma companies can or should be doing. Right, when you think of what they do bring to the table, though, it's kind of reach, especially to clinicians. Right, it's really kind of access to clinicians, it's access to payers. Right, and so, and I think for any DTX partnership, just thinking about. Um, is the pharma company actually um, are they are they able to deliver on what they're committing to, right? And I, you know, as as an example, I think sometimes it becomes a catch-all saying, oh, the pharma company can help us run the study. Well, there's a long list of pharma companies that have struggled running DTX studies, right? And so really be like really be critical of a pharma partner and really do your homework on can they actually have they thought through the level of detail that you to to show that they can execute on it. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I realize that we're at time. I think there's one more question um, that got asked, but pharma seems to be pretty broad and goes from R&D to manufacturing, distribution, retail, brand, et cetera. Um, where are we seeing the most opportunities for difference? I feel like we've answered some part of that question, but I'll flip it a little bit and, and maybe ask Pierre and, and Chris the question of when you do targeted outreach, are you are you mostly doing brand specific outreaches, or are you doing more TA specific or other um, points of input? I'll let Pierre go first. I'll tell you. Yeah, I mean, what we try to do uh, when we do an outreach is really come, you know, very prepared, you know, with you know an analysis that we do uh, with. Uh, you know, two different uh, viewpoints. We look at the you know clinical angle and also the, the business angle. So we have uh, you know a joint effort between our medical affairs team and our business development team to review you know what are the typical drug candidates uh, that could be uh, you know uh, benefiting from uh, from a digital therapeutics approach. So uh, we uh, we come prepared to this conversation with a targeted outreach to the brand teams. You know that we think you know will benefit the most uh, out of you know this uh, this uh, solution, uh, and we uh, you know come prepared with you know a background uh, analysis of the literature that can support also this uh, this project uh, for example on uh, on we also go as far as doing like value modeling uh, you know about uh, okay what would be the incremental impact of introducing
using uh, you know such a digital companion tool you know to uh, in addition to the treatment so uh, those are the kind of you know things that we do uh, on our own you know as we uh, as we engage with these uh, with these groups yeah chris similar i guess in many ways we don't see a lot of interest in r d uh, for digital i know that there was some time that novartis was doing some work with another digital therapeutic company kind of in the R&D side of the house, but uh, you know, we don't find that interest. Part of it is they don't have the budget. Part of it is they don't have that as a priority. You know, their priority is making sure the drug works. Uh, and so digital's an afterthought if it's a thought at all. So uh, all of our discussions are really, well, with the exception of one, I guess, all of our discussions are really on a commercial side. We do have one uh, pharma partner in oncology where we're providing our products to patients on their clinical trials to help them with anxiety, depression associated with the clinical trial. Uh, and we're helping them on five different trials. So, so that is something that's not commercial, I guess, uh, but it's not R&D either, right? So, so we find it's mostly the commercial people. Uh, we're dealing with the brand marketing people. We're dealing with the people that are part of the patient support programs. We're dealing with people that are really focused on uh, trying to deliver better outcomes, holistic outcomes for the patient. Got it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing the time and where we're at time. So again, I appreciate all of you joining us. And I especially appreciate Jan, you being around for this late in the evening for you. Um, so thank you so much, all of you for coming in and, and um, joining us. Those were really insightful comments and, and really appreciate all of you spending the time um, and, and being part of this conversation. We'll, uh, we'll be sharing this recording with everyone who was registered. And so if you guys um, do not receive it, feel free to email us um, at marketing at decimal.health and we'll be happy to get you the recording. Um, and then uh, we will also announce our next uh, episode or our next webinar in the series, uh, which will be taking place somewhere in April. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. And for those of you who are going to be able to make it for DTX West, we'll see you guys in person at DTX West as well. Thank mm -hmm. you all. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.